Very good. Woo! Sorry, <laughs> everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Lots of pictures. Lots of, yeah, lots of pictures. I found them here. So, welcome. They must be very proud. I'm not as parents and I'm proud, so I sit here. Um, my name is Elena Sachs. I'm the Director of Arts and Culture at the Prosserman JCC at the Torrance Christmas Center, uh, the Jewish Community Center here in Toronto. Um, before we begin, I want to Congratulate Ali Gallinger. Are you here in the audience? Woo! Ali participated in our online contest and won herself a so stream. So just find me after the event and so stream. Everyone look under your chair. Um, I just wanted to go through a few thank yous before we start the event. I'm gonna look at my notes because I don't want to forget. I want to thank Deidre and Maria here at Indigo for helping us and for all of our planning. I want to thank SodaStream for their generous and kind donations. Uh, thank you to Ari Badger for your photography. A special thank you to Jennifer Appleby, Andrea Diane, Dana Toplowitz, and Samantha, Samantha Landy for your hard work and guidance. And last but not least, a big thank you to uh, my committee, my chairs, Rafi Blonsky, Adam Norris, and Whitney Park for helping to conceptualize the program, get the word out there, and Rafi we are very pleased uh, to present our program and our special guest this evening. Barry Joseph is the author of Seltzertopia. And Anthony Rose is a restaurateur and the author of The Last Schmaltz. <laughs> and tonight, yes, that is well. Tonight, uh, our moderator, Rafi, will explore some of the common themes in both books and also highlight where they diverge, but also coming down to our collective love for food, drink, and of course, Jewish culture. So a little bit about our panel this evening. Our moderator, Rafi, is the campaign director at JNF Toronto. He has seven years of, are we gonna cheer after every sentence? I just wanna know. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to prepare accordingly. Okay. Rafi has seven years of experience in Jewish communal service with expen extensive experience in fundraising, direct marketing, young leadership development, and social media. His most recent position was as the Toronto Director for Pi Lifeline Canada, and prior to that, as Manager of Strategic Initiatives <coughs> and Young Leaders at UJ Federation of Greater Toronto. Rafi graduated from York University's Business Management Program, where he founded Hasbara at York. He was honored with the prestigious Notable.ca 2015 Award, Best in Nonprofit for Under 40 in Canada, but his greatest accomplishment to date is raising his six and a half month old son, Jaden, and his one and a half year old, her daughter, Sophie, along with his wife, Sadie. Okay, Barry Joseph is the VP of Digital Learning at Girl Scouts in the USA and former Associate Director of Digital Learning at the American Museum of Natural History. Before that, <laughs> Before that, he spent a dozen years as the director of the online leadership program at Global Kids. His effervescent expertise has been featured by the Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, NPR's All Things Considered, CBS Morning News, Boston Magazine, The New York Post, and more. He became interested in Seltzer's history and cultural impact after writing an article about SodaStream for The Forward in 2004 and receiving an outpouring of responses from readers demonstrating their passion for busy. Or it's Elsertopia.com. Okay, this is a long one. Uh, make it short. I, I did. <laughs> I really tried. Anthony Rose has long been a trailblazing force, a trailblazing force in the tutelage of the esteemed goodness of locally produced bounty. Rose started his journey at the California Culinary Academy and applied his learnings at the Lark Creek Inn, now the Tavern at Lark Creek. And next he took his training to Farallon in San Francisco where he achieved a profound level of seafood knowledge, but also a true engagement with the importance and experience of eating. The importance of the experience of eating. Rose then headed, headed to New York where he worked at the Mercer and Alias in the Lower East Side. Elias? Alias, you got it. Farm Fresh became given at this point for Rose to be working in its kitchen, but the icing on his culinary cake is comfort food, as we all know. In 2005, Rose came back to Toronto and began his tenure at the Great Hotel. 
subsequently partnering with Robert Wilder, the two would go on to open six distinct restaurants in Toronto. Rose and Sons, Big Crow, Fat Pasha, Schmaltz Appetizing, Madame Boeuf, and Flea Rose. Chef Rose and his charisma engaged the hearts of not only his diners, but also his purveyors, his kitchen team, and his service staff. He is a celebrated king of the local move of the local movement in the city. He's been referred to has been revered to the leader in comfort cuisine. Whether it's the man's natural charm, dedication to his people and their products, I heard that mom, quality <laughs> and wholesome goodness in any of his menu items, the man's a culinary ingenue in his own right, and we eagerly anticipate where Anthony Rose will take us next. <laughs> I like honey. We like that was like okay. <laughs> we hope you have all enjoyed enjoyed a little bit of a taste of some of his famous salad team. Please, by all means, take more. It'll be out. It'll be there when the program's over alongside um, book sales and signings. And um, I actually would like to first call on Anthony Rose to come up and maybe speak about your inspiration for some of those salad team and um, a bit about your favorite recipes. So without further ado, Anthony Rose. <laughs> <laughs> so these are, I think that, yeah, these are absolutely all in the book, which is pretty cool, the last schmaltz. And, you know, it's funny, when I first opened Fat Pasha, has anyone here ever been to Fat Pasha? Woo! Mm, they goodly amounts of it. You know, there's stuff you can make a reservation now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, when I first uh, wanted to open up uh, Fat Pasha, I'm like, great, you know, we're going to do this, uh, this kind of Middle Eastern Israeli thing, and then the closer I got to opening it, I'm like, well, I haven't really been to Israel once. I don't, I don't really know. Like, I had even kind of like pull off on an almost all that. So we kind of dove really deep to see, you know, what the recipes could be. And we ended up being a little, a little bit of Middle Eastern, a little more Ashkenazi, which I grew up with, like nuts of all soup and brisket and vodkas and stuff like that. Um, but today, I think we're, we're the majority of uh, Middle Eastern and fat fashion. Rose and Sons, we save for all the pastrami and smoked meat. All the must but the, uh, first of all, these guys did a great job. The hummus tastes like uh, garlic, the lava tastes like garlic. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty good. And we got the garlic fried tomatoes as well. I just opened a new restaurant called uh, Fat Zoom, which is um, on the same strip, very close to Fat Pasha, Middle Eastern as well. But you know, it's funny, like tasting all the recipes and getting there. And, and trying to figure out what we're doing, I would go home at night and like I could brush my teeth like five times. My girlfriend Kayla was like, "These teeth are disgusting." <laughs> I would have to turn around to go to bed. But uh, yeah, a lot of these, a lot of these recipes, you know, came from versions of uh, what I loved about Yotam Adelengi, um, versions of um, what what I loved about going to Israel uh, much later with my. Uh, and then it just kind of grew from there. But all the recipes in the book primarily come from one or two or three or four or five of the recipes. And of course my mother as well. And um, it, was, uh, it, it, was, it was a great, um, it was great to write the book. It was a long process. I don't know how, how you felt about writing your book. But I was just so happy when I was over. I thought the greatest part was like, all right, the transcripts in. I'm like, I'm done. And then I kind of forgot about it for six months. Then all of a sudden, the book comes out, and then you have so much work to do as well. But I remember when my editor Zoe just had a baby like yesterday. Do you know that? <laughs> yeah, she had a baby. Yesterday. She was so bright. <laughs> she. Uh, she came to me, she's like, yeah, do you want to write a book? I'm like, you know, I, I never wanted to, but, you know, with her, I would do it. And she was awesome, but it was really easy to decide to write a book. And then she came to me, like, eight months later. She's like, great, let me see what you got. I didn't have anything. So then my co-writer, Chris Johns, came, came on board. And then the book got done uh, really fast. We were very, very proud of the photography in there as well. But, yeah, there's a lot of stories, and it's a very cheeky book. And Schmaltz not only... Um, Obviously, the, the title is a reference to The Last Waltz and the band, but it's also just a schmaltzy book as well, which is a, which is a lot of fun to me. Does anyone have any questions for me? 
Yes. Jonathan, can you repeat the question? Okay. Yeah, yeah, the question was um, what, why she, she was hoping that uh, Petzun was going to be something different. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm, just I'm just joking. You know, it's, it's uh, actually in the, in the past uh, two weeks, that's actually the most common question that I got because Fat Pash is very much a Middle Eastern restaurant. And Fetzun is very much a Middle Eastern. And we've got Rosen Sons, which is the delicatessen. We've got Schmaltz Appetizing, which is an appetizing store. Bagels, Lux, cream cheese, things that go on and with bagels. And we opened up this Barbagonia, which was a French cocktail bar. And after, and Barbagonia you know, was three years old when we closed it. But after like about two and a half years, you're like, oh, it didn't really fit into everything else that we were doing. So we actually made a very conscious effort to dive deeper into what it is to be Jewish and the cuisine that we do, not only Sephardic, but uh, Ashkenazi as well. And we felt like there was enough room to play with in the Middle East and recipes to sustain another restaurant. So the short answer is that Fatzun technically isn't that much different than Fat Passion. But that's okay. Fat Passion is a very busy restaurant. We're hoping that is is uh, quite busy as well. Um, it is much more rustic than Fat Pasha. It's a little louder, much more raucous as well. Uh, it's faster service too. My parents ate there the other night. They were in and out in 45 minutes. Where Fat Pasha would be like an hour and a half. So it's a little more Israeli street food or Middle Eastern street food compared to like you know, sitting down and relaxing and taking your time. Oh, I think totally well. I will. I didn't. No, no, it's guilty now. There will be time for Q and A. So, there's. If you have any questions, feel free to hold on to them, and we'll get to them at the end. That is a great question. So, uh, first of all, before we start, a uh, couple we'll more things. But one person was left out. A big round of applause for Alana who put this on, please. Oh, yeah. Uh, Alana, you know, we worked together at UJ when you were marching living. It was a pleasure to work with you. Make it seamless and make it easy. I just want to say a big thank you and thank you for having me. Uh, so thank you, gentlemen. Uh, Anthony, you got a chance to talk about your book right now and explain, you know, a little behind it. Very your turn, please. Give everyone just like a little elevator pitch about Seltertopia. What's it about? Seltertopia. <laughs> it's not just a place. It's a state of mind. <laughs> this book comes with so much baggage when people first hear about it because they think, how can there possibly be a book about seltzer? And then they start thinking about all the things that must be in it, and they're hoping they're in there. For me, the journey of working on this book was fascinating because I had no association with seltzer. It was this kind of bland, gross-tasting drink growing up when I was having Coca-Cola on my table with my family, competing with who can have the most from the two-liter bottle to dinner. And then when I stopped drinking it in college and felt like something was missing, I realized it was that carbonation. And I went back to seltzer and said, oh, you know what, maybe this is just what I was looking for. But I had no previous associations with it. So over my 14 years working on this book, which came out last year, every year was it another path of discovery down another rabbit hole, just like Alice, discovering the different things that people associate with it. And it's been incredible. And some of the stuff we'll talk about today. But for me, the opportunity to speak with people from all ages, from all over the world, and discover what their personal connections were with it and the passion they had, whether it was from you know relatives 150 years ago or something, someone just now was telling me about getting a soda stream last year. What a difference it made for it. It's here right now. Um, it, it never ends. And the fact that it has that connection and hold on people, not just here in Toronto, but uh, people have been bringing me to communities all over North America. It's just been really exciting. So, thank you. Uh, Anthony, Anthony, book down now? Yeah. <laughs> Anthony, back to you. Um, so I to write a book. Why a cookbook? And why open the vault on your most famous recipes? I, I, I never wanted to write a cookbook. And People had always asked me to, to do that, and, and many um, many editors before Zoe try to try to work with me. And everyone just wanted kind of like an ABC cookbook. This is how you make stock. This is how you make a sauce. And step one, two, three. And I just wasn't into that at all. So Zoe let me do whatever I wanted to do, which, which 
was great. She was totally into it. And in terms of the actual recipes in the book, you know, res recipes aren't sacred. All my recipes come from somewhere else, regardless. You know, there's you know, very few things that haven't been cooked before, or haven't been eaten before. So it was just, it was just natural. I think the hardest recipes to share in the book were actually probably Bonnie Stern's recipes, because um, it had to be very specific. It had to be exactly her recipes. I remember Fat Pasha had altered her hala recipe, and we sent her the original manuscript from the book. She's like, that's not my fucking hala. <laughs> I changed it just to be able to make sure that it uh, to put a name on. And, and Barry, uh, talk about the first lunch that you were told to write a book on Salton. Sure. So, so where does this book come from, right? Yeah. Uh, Soda Stream. It's not new. It's been around for over a decade. Excuse me, over a century. Uh, and in North America, it came over around 2003, 2004. I heard about it. I wasn't obsessed with seltzer at the time. I wasn't an aficionado, but I drank it. I preferred it, like I mentioned, right? And I thought, wow, if I could get one of these new devices, that would be really cool. I could make it in my kitchen. So I thought, if I could write a review copy for the forward, which I write for occasionally, uh, maybe I could get paid to write the review, and I can get a free copy in the mail. And it worked out. It's great. I had a hard time finding anything to write about, because I, I searched online. There were no books about seltzer. There were no, really no articles about seltzer. So I kind of put together what everyone wrote about in all their articles online, interviewed my family members, and published this piece. When it came out, I included my email address at the end, which I'd never done before. And I said, sell me your seltzer stories. And they came in, one after another, they poured in. And one of them said, call me. And I thought, can't you just tell me your story like everyone else? But <laughs> I called them, and they wanted to take me out for lunch. OK, I'll get a lunch out of it. Turned out the woman I was meeting with was the head at the time of the Jewish Book Council Network. Does anyone here know the Jewish Book Council Network? I was the same as you. I had no idea what it was. <laughs> right? Jewish Book Council Network brings together Jewish communities all over North America and offers them books. Books on Jewish topics or books of Jewish authors. And so she knew the book, she knew the Jewish book scene. It also turned out her dad, her husband, her brother, and her son, all in the Seltzer movies. And this was the time of the micro histories. Cod, salt. She said, Why isn't there a book on Seltzer? You should write it. And then she can give you some advice. So she did. Over the years she gave me advice. And then when my book was ready to come out, I went to the Jewish Book Council Network, which is 112 JCCs and Jewish book fairs all over North America, and 250 authors. We each have two minutes to get in front of this crowd. No more, no less. Two minutes to make our pitch, and they get off the stage. And then after that, they contact the JBC network and say, here's who we want to come speak. That's how I got here today. The JCCs up here, we're there, heard me give my two minute pitch, and here I am. So okay, it went full circle. The person who gave me the idea to write the book, then gave me the space to let me be here today. And that's, that's very moving for me. Awesome. So let's bring Schmaltz and Seltzer together. Let's talk Lower East Side, Schmaltz, Seltzer, Sammy's, Romanian. Let's. Everyone has a Sammy story. So set the scene for your Sammy story and describe it to everybody. And whoever wants to go first, this is for both of you. Okay. I'm happy to go second. You can go first. I've been to Sammy's uh, many times. I like to go by myself so I can see as much as I want. <laughs> but essentially, like you walk into, I brought brought my business partner Rob the first time we went to New York together, and we had already we'd already eaten four meals on walking from Soho to Sammy's, and he had never been there. And you walk in, and it's like you go, you go downstairs, and it's kind of gross. Like the stairs are gross, the restaurants just kind of gross, and. This day, they actually had a sewer pipe broken in their restaurant. There's still people dining in there. There's still lots of guys like me, like single guys, hanging out with their schmaltz and their liver and their, and their sweetbreads. And um, we, we go in and we sing, we eat. And then Rob, this was, I guess, right before Fat Pasha, he's like, oh my god, this liver is so good. And we asked the guys, like, you know, we, we want to make this recipe in Toronto. Like, yeah, whatever, just use the word Sammy's, and, and that was it. So we put it on the menu, and it was, I think it was the first or second week, and it was a uh, liver a la, a la Sammy's. And this, this table calls me over, and he's like, you know, this, this is my dad's liver. What do you mean? Well, my, my dad uh, owns Sammy's. 
I didn't know it was at Toronto Institution, or owned by a Toronto. I was like, well, no, you know, I, he, he wanted it a card game. <laughs> oh, oh that's fair. Yeah. I'm like, okay. Yeah, I haven't seen that guy since. <laughs> All right, I've got a funny Sammy story. My last time at Sammy's was New Year's Eve 98. So if you think of Schmaltzy on a regular night, imagine it on a New Year's Eve. I'm there with my best friend. New Year, midnight comes, we all go to the payphone, before cell phones, to call our parents and say, you know, Happy New Year. Stephen puts his dad on the phone with me, and he says one thing. He just says, Bear, he called me back, Bear, don't let him have the schmaltz. And then he died. <laughs> Three hours later. Oh, did I say this a funny story? Sorry, it's a sad story. He was sick. We knew he was sick. And he passed away. So the last thing he ever said to me about my best friend and about his son was, don't let him eat the schmaltz. Two decades later, if I ever need to push him on something, do you have an old friend? You're the one who can say to him something and no one else can say it when they do something I shouldn't do? I have a lecture moral authority behind me because I can say, and your dad said, don't eat the schmaltz. That's the funny part. <laughs> so, Barry, I'm going to continue on your book. Tell us some of your favorite chapters and your favorite themes specifically from the part two of the book, the humor, the Jewish history part sure. of it, please. So I talked about those associations before that I didn't have coming into it that never stopped being reflected back to me from people I talked to. So let me ask you guys, when you knew you were coming here tonight to hear a talk that was going to include something about seltzer, what did you think you were going to hear about? <laughs> <laughs> on the count of three, shout it out. One, two, three. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, blue, not sure. Yeah. The origins of seltzer. The origins of seltzer. Anyone else? The bottle. The bottle. The seltzer yes. size Uh huh. Anyone in the back? What's that? Two cents plain. Anything else? New York. New York. So most of the things you just heard are about nostalgia. Not all of them, but many of them are. They're just things that are old, things from the past, things that aren't around anymore. And that's a big part of Seltzer's story. As Seltzer got really popular, as Eastern European Jews came to New York City, and as the practice spread from New York to other metropolitan areas, around 1920, Seltzer was kind of at the peak of its popularity. But then decade after decade after decade, it got less popular. Until it looked like in the 70s, it was just going to disappear. Then this new drink came to North America from France. Anyone know what it's called? Perrier. Changed everything. Not just for seltzer, but for everything. It introduced the idea of single servings of bottled water, uh, yuppies at the time, it made it hip and cool to pay extra for water with minerals in it. Some people, like Jews, said, wait a second, we've been drinking stuff like this for a while. Why don't we have to go to Perrier? And seltzer started getting popular again. In the 70s and the 80s, and people added flavors. 90s to now, where it's more popular than I think it's ever been before. Now, many audiences I speak with, the nostalgia isn't the thing that comes to mind, because they're looking at it from today, not just that thing from the past. They're thinking about um, what does it mean to uh, incorporate it into a philosophy of drink, having local products, or taking care of your body and being healthy. Um, they're thinking about um, comedy, uh, which is more of the past than the present. Uh, Simpsons, uh, Mary Tyler Moore, Three Stooges, right? Um, uh, you asked me the first question, was one of, the, one, one of my favorite or surprising sections in the book? Yeah. It just never ended. Really? I, I had to stop writing the book at one point because I had to get the book out. But it would never would have stopped. Every year there's something new about seltzer and something different. Who would have thunk it? Huh? Who would have thunk it? It looked like it was just some carbonated water and it was barely enough to fit into a review. And I had a 600 page book of just the good stuff. And I had to get down to 300 pages. Wow. And that's the stuff that stayed in. So for me, as I mentioned before, there's so many different aspects of seltzer. It all comes together because people are passionate about it, what it means for people. But the directions that passion takes, it is endless and never ends. And that's been the most surprising thing about it. And in that research, to get that 600 pages, was there a certain theme? What was the favorite theme or something that you discovered that was, wow? Well, when I started looking at writing the book, because there was nothing else to read, I had to interview people. Scores of interviews. If you were sitting next to me here uh, at, at an event, uh, you were looking at books, I'm going to turn to you and ask you a bunch of questions about seltzer. I record it on the subways in New York City, walking down the street, my colleagues at the conference, over 100 people. And that gave me a sense of what the possible things were. Seltzer's association with health, with comedy, with ethnic identity, and with, with a good beverage. But that's not enough for a book. There's nothing tied it all together. So I had these like um, columns almost of concepts, but I was missing the human interest story. And then I got an email, as I often did, because I was kind of hung my light out there, like I'm a Celtic guy, I can talk to him. And this, this guy who's an ad executive in Pittsburgh, I'm a Celtic guy, wear it on me, 
he worked for PBS. He did advertising for, remember, um, Where the World is Carmen San Diego? Yes. He decided to buy a side business just for fun with his partner. This 120-year-old sales so business, a film business. And he was looking for a part for siphons. We were talking about the siphons, the tin carts on the top you need tomorrow. He contacted me. Of course, I didn't have them, but I loved talking to him. It was like two hours on the phone, and I said, ah, this is what I'm missing. A human interest story. Why would this guy who's an ad executive give it all up to own a seltzer works in Pittsburgh? What would drive him to do that? And then I started meeting people like that all over the country. And I realized, that's what I'm missing. What's driving people today to be so excited about seltzer? Uh, Anthony, for you, what was two parts of your book? favorite recipe that you love to make yourself, and what is your favorite one to actually share and uh, have other people experience that? The, the, the one that people, I'm gonna go with the one that people love to make the most is, is probably the pork fried rice, uh, which to me is the most Jewish recipe in the world. <laughs> <laughs> Stunning, and serving it at Lily Sons uh, since day one when we turned into the deli, now we serve uh, the strong fried rice. Great recipe. It's actually one of the ones that I've carried with me since uh, the probably mid '90s in San Francisco. We went on road trips to where we used to die for a hole in the wall that served uh, Dungeons Crab fries. Dungeons Crab was everywhere, all the way up and down the, the coast there. So it was, it was very decadent. So it was kind of like you either come it up or come it down. But I just love uh, you know, making really good fried rice with really good pork and smoked back. Does anyone eat pork here? You all eat pork. <laughs> <laughs> if their moms are here, so their hands are dead. Yeah, exactly. um, and then the, the, the one that, the one recipe I think that um, I love the most, there's, there's, there's probably a few of them, and I would say most of them are extremely uh, uh, nostalgic. Um, one of them is, is my mom's uh, blueberry uh, crumble, which is something that you know, she, she had made for, for years, and I kind of remembered it as a kid. And you hadn't made it for, for a very, very, very long time. And then I guess it was last year, the year before, you know, I, I wanted her to make it. I needed the recipe, and but I, I, had, I hadn't made it you know, forever. So we were going up to the cottage, and we made it there, and you know, we, we ate it, and we've been making it again ever since. Very, very cool. Um, I talked about the, the, the challah and Bonnie Stern's uh, challah. You know, we uh, now make her challah at many of the restaurants. And one, one of the uh, my favorite oddest things, oddest recipe from the book is the um, is, is the shore lunch. Do you know what shore lunch is? No. So a, sh a shore lunch would be all these. Um, Either, either fishermen, you were going on like a fishing trip or you were going tree planting or something like that and, and you would bring like a can of beans and you, were, you would get some, some uh, trout out of, the, out of the river, like you know, way up north, like uh, five or six hours up north. And we went up there and did this. Um, essentially the recipe, you know, calls for like bring a can of beans and, uh, you know, bring, uh, you know, some rashers of uh, whatever and go catch a fish. Um, that to me is one of my favorite things. We actually did that. We went up there. Awesome. We went up to Tanagami. Oh, nice. It was like, we were like not only five and a half hours north of Toronto, but then we took a plane another half hour in to the <laughs> middle of nowhere. It's, uh, it was pretty fantastic. And so, actually, I want to ask this, and I'm sure everyone else has this on their mind. What's your favorite restaurant to eat in Toronto? My favorite yeah. restaurant? Yeah. Um, and be selfish if you want to vote. No, you know, it's, it's funny. I, I, I eat in my restaurants when I'm there. And, my, my son doesn't always like to go to the restaurants just because, uh, and I actually don't love eating there with, with my family or my friends because I find them extremely distracted. Uh, looking at the food, looking at people's experiences and their, and their faces. Uh, and I do tend to go to the same restaurants over and over and over again. And one of them uh, would be Allen's in Danforth. Um, one of the best pubs in the city. Uh, great, great simple wedding stand. Yeah. <laughs> this is a sister lives right there. I've been there. It's a fantastic place. Yeah. It's, uh, it's been there. It's been there for forever. Um, and the, the history of even that, like they used to have Joe Allen's downtown, and then you know, Joe Allen's in New York City, which is in the theater district. Um, uh, it's, it's a very odd, amazing history. But to me, it's just one you know, of the greatest experiences uh, uh, in the city. Um, 
And even we were talking about the pickle barrel before, but and I'm sure a lot of you guys know the pickle barrel was like the original deli in Toronto before it is what it is now. Years ago. It's pretty cool. Uh, next thing we want to talk to you about is challenges and obstacles of writing the book. So Barry, uh, the fact finding was it paltry, was it robust? Well, it's right. Yeah. was talking to people, right? So having in, in the days when Google was young and you couldn't search their, the books that we put on, which is just incredible, it was all about talking to people, which on one hand was great. I got to meet people. It was super fun, but it was hard. I had to find the people. Then Google Books came out and suddenly I can research books from 100 years ago that were all in the, in the public domain and I can read people's personal tours of Nieder Seltzer, the town where Seltzer actually came from in Germany, where people went you know, 150 years ago to describe what it was like. And suddenly, I had this wealth of information. But as I mentioned, the hardest thing for me was stop it. I mean, boy, every year something was new, right? So right now, anyone watch any commercials during the Super Bowl? Yeah. Like, not one, but two commercials about seltzer. A few years ago, SodaStream had a seltzer commercial. That was a big deal. It was all about making fun of Coke and Pepsi, and how bad they are for the planet and bad for your body. Drink us instead. Now we had an ad for hard seltzer, which has become popular in the last few years, alcohol and seltzer, and a Pepsi ad. Not for Pepsi soda, but for Bubbly, which is over there. They're flavored seltzer. So, and at the same time, not only is Pepsi trying to compete with LaCroix with their own flavored seltzer, they also now own Soda Street. As of this January, they're running. Them. So what a change. That's just one area to look at. So for me, the hardest thing was stopping. <laughs> That's a good problem to have. Yeah. And Anthony, for you, what was the most challenging aspect for you for writing a cookbook? The, 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 the most... Everything was challenging. Like I, I'm, not, I'm not a writer, and you know, I'm also trying to run six restaurants in the same time. Like it, it was a lot of work. Um, finally, it was like done. The manuscript was in. I could just totally forget about it. And then Zoe's like, "All right, so who's, who's going to write the introduction? Who's going to write the foreword?" I'm like, "Oh, I, I didn't even think of it." So you know, I I was starting to think like way up here. Um, so. We, uh, my, my editor, Random House in Toronto, is where Margaret Atwood is as well. So, you know, I got I got the question to Margaret Atwood. <laughs> of course, yeah. um, she she politely declined. <laughs> uh, busy with Handmaid's Tale. I'm like, oh, that's, a, that's a that's a good excuse. Um, I, I you know I had a connection to, to Getty Lee. Wasn't interested. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> He was busy with, with his own book, and then, um, and then uh, I even asked uh, Bonnie Stern, and Bonnie's like, you know, there's and there, there's a lot of Bonnie in the book. She's like, yeah, I think there's enough of me in the book. I don't, I don't think you need me for the forward. And then I asked another friend of mine, who's, who's a wonderful cookbook author, uh, Naomi Degui, who's a Toronto author as well. And you know, she's like, you know, Anthony, like. I know you. You know we're we're acquaintances. We're not we're not good friends. Like you really need someone to, to write the forward that you know knows you intimately. I'm like oh my mom. So that was, that was the hardest best part of the book, and it's probably the one thing that I get the, the most compliments on. Yeah. Very very personal. And the theme of the title of the book. Yeah. Yeah. So it's great. It's very sweet. For me, looking for verbs was also quite challenging and also quite fun. Um, I actually had something about Mel Brooks in the book, so I thought, maybe I can find Mel Brooks. And I figured, you know, he's not just from the past, he's still doing stuff today. He has a production company in Culver City, found it online. I talked to the person who answered the phone and said, you know, can I get something from, from Mr. Brooks? And she said, well, you know, he's got a lot of other stuff on his plate. Uh, call back next week. She was one of those people who were like, I, I, I'm not going to give you what you want right now, but I'm not going to discourage you. You can always come back next week. So I came back next week for months. I kept calling back. I said, it's on the pile. He hasn't looked at it yet. You can call me next week. I eventually gave up. I just stopped calling. And then two months later, I got the email from him. And I got the quote from him. Seltzer told me is the best book I ever read on Seltzer. <laughs> that's awesome. So can you help me today by buying all the copies we have and I can get to the reprint? That's going to be on the front. Yeah. That's awesome. So going back to what you said, you're having your mother write the forward of your book. I don't know. There's nothing more Jewy than that, let's be honest. <laughs> so, both of you, how do you define your Jewishness? And why was it so important for you to weave that into your books? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I, I think that J Jewishness for me, much uh, in my, my 40s now, um, you know, it was uh, it was really it was really found. You know, I remember that um, 
know, originally when, when we opened Rosen Sons, and we had like matzo ball soup on the menu, but we had like BLT and pork fried rice on the menu, and a reviewer called me out for that. And um, I, my dad was, you know, upset about it as well. And I, I was, I, I got upset about it too, that, you know, number one, you know, it's my own comfort level. You know, granted, you know, it's, it's not how, how you live and how you do things. And, uh, it was pretty judgy, but that was fine. And I think much, much later in life, now that I have a son, you know, it's um, Jewishness to me, and even in, in the book, was really just about it was about food, it was about culture and and uh, and people. My son, you know, when we were uh, he went to Hebrew school for a very short period of time. He just like hated it, and it was like harder to get him there to. He didn't like do anything, and it was like hard for me, hard for him. I'm like, oh, we, we just gave up. So as his bar mitzvah was coming closer, you know, I got you know, a friend of mine to you know, give him lessons, not necessarily in Hebrew, a little bit of Hebrew, but to read it in English and just kind of like understand what his portion was about. And, and as we got closer, um, we're like, all right, we gotta, we gotta find someone to do the ceremony, to do everything. And I'm like, ah, I'm, I'm just gonna do it. So I did it. I did the whole ceremony, and you know I think that you know go, going into it, you know I felt like you know I could have um, offended my parents or some other people that you know might have been there, being like, well, you can't really do that. But it was it was to me like the actual epitome of the most personal way that you could ever have to do a bar mitzvah. It was, it was sweet. It was memorable. You don't, you don't ever get a chance to do that. So I was, I was very, very happy about that. So it's, it's just always your own comfort level. It's, it's pretty cool. Once, I actually want to add a story to your parents here too, and I think you should hear this. So being in the Jewish Journal community, we do a lot of events, sometimes fundraising, but we have an organization that we partner with Israel called Brothers for Life. It's wounded IDF vets, who assist newly wounded IDF vets. And they do this on the grassroots level, they're volunteering, they help each other out. We had two delegations this past summer, 2018 and 2017. And you know, I want you guys to check it out because you should know he opens restaurants both times for them. He had the patio and that patio open for the guys. All the favorites were set out for them. He took care of them, hosted them. So you should know that you guys done a great job. Stucca is on his mind. And just so people know, the, the J is big in you. It's in your heart too. It's not something that's just in your book. And I want you to share that story because it's unpublished. And people don't know that story. It's not something you'll see on his Instagram stories or anywhere. So I just want to give you a little plug for that. Thank you. Thank you. Can you frame the question for me? Yeah, of course. So, how do you define your own Jewishness, and why was it so important for you to weave it into your? Uh, how do I define my own Jewishness? Uh, I'm Jewish from head to toe. Nice. Um, I grew up a Reformed Jew from Long Island. Uh, like most Reformed Jews, hated going to temple and hated the Hebrew school, and then left and went to college. Uh, left New York. Went. Oh, wait a second. I'm Jewish. Everything else around me isn't the same as when I was growing up. So, what does it mean to be Jewish? What are the values, what are the activities, what are the history? And I started exploring, you know, with my peers when I came back to New York City, kind of creating Jewish communities for myself. And I went and I met my wife uh, 20 years ago. We looked at Jewish communities in New York and eventually found a home for ourselves, not by finding the right place. There is no right place. But finding a place that we can help make it to where we want it to be. And now when I have two kids, my son's about to become a um, it's, it's so meaningful to me that we were able to make that Jewish community where we live with, with ourselves and our friends um, to be a place where we can live our values, where we can um, have rituals, where we can feel comforted when times are tough. Um, we're going to do the book. So, the book, Seltzer, Seltzer and Jews. There's so much I can say, we don't have that much time, so we'll start with here. If you're Jewish, if you're here with someone Jewish, who is a part of you a little bit that sometimes wishes you were Jewish, put up your hand. <laughs> Thank you. So, that being the case, why? Why is there an association between Seltzer and Jews? So there's a chapter in the book just about that, how Seltzer found religion, how Seltzer got religion. And that answers that question. But if I took that chapter out of the book, the whole book would still be Jewish. Almost everyone in the book I interview is Jewish. Not everybody. John Seekings, the man in Pittsburgh I talked about, he's not Jewish, but his business partner is who we bought it with. All the Seltzer men on the East Coast, on the West Coast, the Seltzer women on the West Coast, all Jewish. The people I'm writing about from 100 years ago, Jewish. When you go back into the 19th century, not Jewish. Something shifted around 1900, and it became intricately woven. And for so many of us that feel this connection somehow, Jews and Seltzer, there's, there's no uh, coincidence that all the places we go to around North America are JCCs and right? 
um, the Catholic Diocese is not inviting me to come talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a complicated history. I'll say in short, Seltzer's Jewish, and Seltzer isn't Jewish. It's Jewish because we make it Jewish, because for many Jews, not all, it's meaningful. It connects to that nostalgia as we talked about before. Not just because of what the drink is, but because of what it's associated with. There's a book um, I talk about in my book from the 1981 called Up From Seltzer. Is it a book about Seltzer? No, it's a book about Jews. It's a book about four generations of Jews, the first Jews that came to North America, each generation after that, the fourth one being the ones writing it. And the, it's a comic panel, it's four panels, it's the same one on every page, but a different caption. And the joke is how the generations change over time. So the one that says what they drank, the, the, the shtetl couple that looks like they're still traumatized and came over from the boat, uh, it says for two cents plain. And the bottom right, where these two Jews, don't look like Jews, with these beautiful Jew froze, uh, it says uh, Perrier. Right? <laughs> so that's a joke, right? And so the book says it's about Seltzer, but really it's about generations of Jews and how happy we are that we came up from Seltzer and we left that, that part of our past. But of course, the, the irony is, as we became Jewish Americans, and as we went through this revival in the 70s and 80s, we wanted to claim that part of our past. We reclaimed Seltzer and all that nostalgia that it was connected to. But at the end of the day, we claimed it because it was meaningful to us in that past. But at the same time, we're not the only ones who drank Seltzer. We might be the only ones who called it Seltzer. People might call it carbonated water, they might call it sparkling water, it might be mineral water, it might be club soda, and it's part of a universal thing. So my last question to both of you, and then we'll open up to Q&A. What's next for you? What's next for you? Yeah. Do you mean other than uh, Ohio like and been. Florida and yeah. all the other JCCs? Um, this is a passion project for me. I wrote it for 14 years on the subway going to and from work. I can't believe it actually got published. I can't believe people want to come hear me talk about it. And that for me is the passion. That's the next thing. Spreading the word. All I want is for people to read the book. Let the gospel of Seltzer. Let the gospel of Seltzer. I'm spreading the spritz. And I want people to understand the full story of what Seltzer is about because it's never been written before. And if I do this now for the rest of my life on my weekends, I'll be happy. Awesome. Say question to you. You know, I, I just opened a restaurant three days ago. No big deal. Thanks for being I, here. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to going to uh, Whistler with my son. Uh, That's awesome. The, the, most, the, the, the next day. <laughs> that is. Q&A right, open to the audience. Uh, just put your hand up and, and be really loud. Yeah, please. What's your name? What does Seltzer mean? So I mentioned the town of Niederselters. Niederselters is the town in Germany that was a spa that people went to. It was one of many spas. It was one of many spas that bottled and sent, sold out their water. For whatever reason, their town got the name of what we call that water. Selters, and the word Niederselters became Seltzer, and Selters means salty water. The irony being that Seltzer in America is carbonated water, nothing added, no salt. <laughs> Was, uh, was you had um, made kosher for the Seltzer and the, and the Jewish uh, population? Uh, you bets uh, comes out of uh, Canarsie, Brooklyn. Wait, you bets is a chocolate syrup. Yeah. Or, or started as a chocolate syrup. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'm going to talk some more about it in a bit. We have our egg cream component. But to answer your question, uh, it was a, a Jewish man uh, in Canarsie who made it, cooking up the syrup in his kitchen. Uh, and it was, uh, I think, five generations owned until it was sold last year to Golds. Folks make a horseradish, right? Um, and so they were part of the Jewish community. And the, the seltzer trucks you would see driving around the city would have you bets painted on the outside, and that would be the relationship. You seltzer man delivering to the houses, you're gonna sell our syrup, no one else's, and we're gonna get to paint this beautiful thing on the side of your truck and make it look great. So they knew they were selling straight to the, the Jewish community, straight to the homes. Five generations down there. Yeah. Wow. As were many of the businesses that I interviewed um, for it. And that's part of what people associate with Seltzer often. This idea of local businesses, families, getting to know people, getting, having them know your kids as they grow up. And, and you best is just one of those many family stories that are connected to Seltzer and what people value about it. Do you ask if I had a Seltzer bottle collection? Um, over time, yes, I had to eventually get some siphons. I have a whole section about one of the top siphon collections in the country, I would never even say I anything like that. But I find one in a, in a used, uh, you know, antique store. And it's, it has a beautiful color or a beautiful shape. Uh, I'll, I'll pick it up. <laughs> Some of them are gorgeous. They really are works of art. Yeah. <laughs> Please. <laughs>
Um, yeah, the seltzer delivery. Like I can understand like how it, how it started. And I know that there's only one left in Toronto. Um, Is he here tonight? No. <laughs> He's busy working. He's not. He, he bought into it, and I know he was trying to sell it to someone else. Um, but even like getting it delivered to, to my door, you can get like a six pack for like fifteen dollars or twenty bucks dollars or something like that. He had to buy all the old ones to do it and refurbishing them. It was quite expensive. Is that like a completely dying thing in, in New York as well? So it's hard to say. Um, the oldest seltzer man in the country, Eli Miller, retired a year or two ago. Um, he was amazing. Uh, you gotta imagine how heavy these these wooden boxes are already heavy, and then siphons in them which are heavy, and then they're filled with the the seltzer. When I, I spent a day going around with him, I tried to help him lift them. I couldn't lift him. The guy was in his 80s, uh, you know, lugging them on his shoulders. He retired. When he was when he retired, people were thinking, oh, is this the end? He sold the business to Alex Gomberg, who was 26 years old. It was during the recession. Uh, he just got out of college, couldn't find a job. His grandfather was a seltzer man. His dad was in the beverage business. His dad still had one of the only lasting seltzer works in the, in the city. He didn't bring out the bottles, but people who had the bottles would come and get them filled there. So he said, you know what, Dad, if I'm ever going to do this, I'm going to do it now. So on one hand, you have the oldest guy leave the business, and then you have the youngest guy in the country pick it up. So it's anyone's guess what's going to happen next. And there's people all over the country who are still delivering. Southern California, middle of California, uh, Florida, two places in Florida, uh, all over New York City. Last question. Ron. I remember growing up. Here in Toronto? Yeah. 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 Put up your hand if you're from Toronto and remember having someone deliver. Right. Good memory. I hope. That's <laughs> question. Okay. What are you doing to influence the next generation? Because you are getting old. Please repeat that question loudly. So. <laughs> She wants to know what I'm doing to um, influence the, the next generation because I'm getting old. <laughs> now I don't feel so bad about that. <laughs> what am I, 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 try to, I try to lead by example. Like um, um, one of my cooks, Jason, Jason, whose sister is here today, you know, we've, we've cooked together now for, I, know, I think like almost five years. And, you know, he started as a, as a very as a, as a young kid back back then. Um, he's kind of like he was started as a prep cook, then a cook, and now he's a sous chef. And you know, his heart is in baking. And he's at the he's at the deli. He's at Big Pro as well. And you know, I know that um, you know, he he wants um, more always. He's extremely eager. Um, he, it's it's really just about. You know, I, I can only do so much. Like I've got six restaurants, I've got six chefs, and you know, I, I only have like so many relationships that I can kind of like really, really nurture. But it's it's really just about the people that you hire and the people that you put in place and trusting them. And sometimes it doesn't work out. You know, it's uh, it, it is it's, it's very difficult. Um, Jason, however, is one of you know very few uh, Jewish guys that works for me, and. I would love him to kind of like, you know, and he, he wants to work at Pat Pasha or at Petsun. Like he spent some a good amount of time in Israel. Um, yeah, but like cooking isn't a, cooking isn't a very, isn't a thing that many Jewish kids go into. Especially when I went into it. Um, it was seen as like, you know, like a, a very blue collar kind of, kind of way. And then it just kind of uh, blew up. And, you know, it's, it is very difficult. Uh, so I love it. My guys work really hard, so it is. It's about the education, just like a nutrient, quite a bit. It's hard to keep it. I don't know if I answered your question. But did you enjoy it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It was like a good story about Jason. <laughs> <laughs> the gentleman will stay around afterwards. If you have any other questions, tucked in there. You can ask him one on one if you were too embarrassed to ask everyone out loud. Uh, now, for an exciting part of the evening, I'll like to call up Barry Joseph to do a demonstration. That's me. How to make the perfect egg cream. All right. So, I mentioned, for a second, this is working, that Mel Brooks was willing to give me something for my book. He was willing to do that, or at least I had the foots to ask him, because I quoted him in the book. So I'm going to share that with you. If that's all right, would you like to hear that? It's a paragraph. You sure you want to hear it? Yeah. 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 To do that, I got to put on my Fox's syrup hat. I got when I visited the plants. 
Davenport moved to Long Island, and I have the pin on it, my now fizzing pin. Now fizzing is the secret seltzer lovers group on Facebook. Anyone here who's in the group? <laughs> well done. <laughs> All right. This is from an issue of Playboy, 1974. There's a big interview with Mr. Brooks. He had two movies out that year. And for some reason, talking about one of his movies, it suddenly shifted to the topic of egg creeps. And they said, how do you make an egg cream? And this is what he said. First, you got to get a can of Fox's You Bet Chocolate Syrup. Take a big glass and fill one-fifth of it with You Bet Syrup. Then, add about half a shot glass of milk. And you got to have a seltzer spout with two speeds. One son of a bitch bastard that comes out like bullets and scares you. <laughs> one normal, regular person speed that comes out nice and soft and foamy. So hit the tough bastard, the bullets of seltzer first. <laughs> Smash through the milk into the chocolate and chase the chocolate furiously all around the glass. Then, when the mixture is halfway up the glass, you turn on the gentle stream and you fill the glass with seltzer, all the time mixing with a spoon. Then taste it, but sit down first because you might swoon with ecstasy. <laughs> <laughs> so that issue of Playboy came out and Mr. Fox gets a phone call from a friend. David, your company's in Playboy. He ran out, got copies for all the workers, <laughs> and then he wrote a letter, which he gave to me. I'm gonna read you that letter. February 7th, 1975. Mel Brooks, care of Screen Actors Guild, Sunset Boulevard, Hollywood, California. Dear Dr. Brooks, I have just finishing your, finished reading your brilliant and most timely critique of the medicinal uses of Fox's You Bet, the all healing elixir. By way of congratulating you on bringing to the attention of the medical profession, as well as to all laymen, this ancient of Hebraic potions, we wish to maintain the supply in your apothecary jars. If you would be so kind as to forward your address to the writer, we will send via eyes only mail enough product to keep you supplied knee deep in bubbly egg creams. Very truly yours, H. Fox and Company, Inc., David Fox. Residents. What do you think the second thing I have? Here? <laughs> February 26, 1975. Dear David, I am at 20th Century Fox. Uncle Joe was a furrier at IJ Fox, and now I get a letter from David Fox of H. Fox and Company, <laughs> makers of that dark ambrosia commonly referred to as Fox's You Bet Chocolate. It means something. I don't know what, but it means something. <laughs> anyway, I thank you for your kind offer. Money, diamonds, jewels I could refuse, but never a couple of jars of you bet chocolate. <laughs> Send it to me quick, now. Milk and seltzer are waiting. I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I remain your obedient Jew, Mel Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, it's set up. Time to make some egg breaks. And I'm gonna need some help. Let me first ask, is there anyone here between zero and nine years of age? Okay, anyone here from 10 to 19? Anyone here from 20 to 29? All right, have any of you made egg creams before? No. No. Which one should I pick? Both of them. Both, Both of them. them. Did, you, did you know you? Okay, two of you two come up, okay? All right, uh, who here uh, hasn't had an egg cream, who, who knows egg creams, but hasn't made one in the last 10 years, and is missing it, is so nostalgic for it now, they can't stand it, because they've been hearing us talk about it. All right. Okay, who used to get seltzer delivered in Toronto? Yeah. All right, how about you? Come on. Yeah. And I need three for a bit. Going down there. Going on. Indirect. What's your name? Daniel. Thank you. What's your name? Rebecca. Rebecca. And what's going on? What's your name? Marilyn. Thank you, Marilyn. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We have all the things you need to make an egg cream. We have milk. We have a brand of seltzer never heard of, but I don't care as long as it's seltzer, okay, <laughs> with no flavoring in it. We have a beautiful tall glass, uh, a nice straw, reusable straw, and a nice spoon, a long spoon, that's helpful. And finally, what's the last ingredient? Fox. Fox, as you bet, which I had to bring from home because no one could find any here in Toronto. There, I, some, I know who carries it. Yes. Small, small appetizers. <laughs> uh, now we have so this is from New York City as well. And uh, imagine getting this on the plane and getting it up here. We did it. It's here today. It's great. From this morning. So we're going to start with the milk. Open up your milks. I always do this. I said that, but it's actually 
Now that we did that, we're going to do the ukulele. Chocolate. Chocolate. Now the chocolate, it's different for everybody, but I think like about my thumbnail, right? So watch what I do. Pour it in. Put up my thumbnail. There you go. And if you like chocolate a lot, you do a little more. And if you want a little bit less, that's fine too. I get the chocolate in there. The thumbnail is like relative. <laughs> Excellent. We're going Wherever down the line. Whatever yours. <laughs> Who here has had egg cream in the last year? Wow. Who's had egg cream in the last five years? Never. Egg cream in the last since in 2000. Oh, the people. <laughs> All right. Good. Now, the next is the milk. You want to put in as much milk as chocolate, but you can put a little bit more in depending on how much you want. Now, there's different ways to make an egg cream. I'm not going to tell you the one right way because I don't want to get into an argument. There's the Brooklyn way, there's the Bronx way, the Manhattan way, the Chicago way. That's why I like to do it. And of course, we're excellent. Well done, guys. We are doing this here, of course, without those seltzer siphons that Mel talking about. So if we had the, that pressure, we would then squirt it right in. We don't have that. So we're going to use the spoons. And we're going to mix it around. So you're essentially making chocolate milk right now. <laughs> you want to make it so it's not chocolate in the bottom and milk on the top. Go faster. There, there you go. Mm -hmm. Looks good. <coughs> Excellent. Stop right there. Right now, open up your seltzers. I'm going to have a sip. Now, what's most often done is not just pouring it right in, but pouring it in right off the spoon. Oh. See, I heard someone said that. Do you know why? I don't know why. But I have <laughs> <laughs> told to break up the bubbles somehow. All right. So let's pour it right off the spoon. This is going. It's kind of coming in right now. And you want to do it about an inch from the top and stop because it's going to keep bubbling up. It'll so, start to get a little head. And then, Spoon right in the middle and kind of spin it around so it stays up the same on the top and moves around at the bottom. Because if you do it too much, you're going to kill the seltzer. It's going to be flat. And then when you're done, you fill the seltzer to the top. It's not a great head. Each one with a soda jerk competing with all these three other corners. It's fantastic. What tastes? It's outrageous. 
And so they had all sorts of drinks, fizzy flips and phosphates and whatnot. The egg cream is the one that survived. There's still, at least in America, the, um, a cherry lime ricky. Uh, sometimes you'll hear about black and whites, but otherwise that's it. What happened to these hundreds, thousands of other drinks? So my question for you is, if the egg cream didn't make it here to Toronto, is there something else that did, something else seltzer-based? And maybe nothing did, did it, but did anything survive? <laughs> but you can still make it yourself. Maybe it's time to bring it back. This night, at this place, you can say you were there when the egg cream came to Toronto. Barry, why eggs? There's no eggs in it. Not only is there no eggs, there's also no cream. cream. Right? No eggs, no cream. And so uh, I see your hands. Let me, let me respond to that one. So yeah, so why is it called egg cream? There's no egg and cream. So think about Jews on the Lower East Side, New immigrants to America, and wanting to have the fancy drinks that everyone's making uptown. What's in the fancy drinks? Eggs were in drinks. That was a thing you can get. At, there was all, you, you can find pages and pages if you were a new soda jerk of drinks you can make that were just about drinks with eggs. And having milk in it or a, a finer cream, I should say, right, uh, was seen as fancy. So to have something that looked like it for two cents or three cents could make you feel like you were having something a little special. So that, that's my understanding of, of where that came from. But to be respectful, I saw there was two oh, hands. <laughs> 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 um, I've had a chocolate phosphate that Um, so, uh, uh, just as there were many pages of ingredients of things to do with eggs, there are also many pages of things to do with phosphate. So often you'll find a cherry phosphate. Phosphates will, will um, uh, dull the, the edge of the, the sweetness, and you can taste it in a kind of a rounder way. So what you had was not an egg cream, um, but it was something egg cream-ish with a phosphate in it. I was just going to say, we recently took a friend's grandmother to Rose and Sons for her first egg cream in 55 years. Wow. So. She was so thrilled because she hadn't had one since she lived in New York. Right, exactly. Yeah. And so we got it the most. Otherwise, those would be the same. You had a question or a comment? Uh, you, you, where did you? Uh, I, the depths of hell? I don't know. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean, I drank it a lot when I was a kid growing up at pizza parlors. But I don't even know if it's officially chocolate milk. <laughs> it's a chocolatey, creamy thing with sugar. That's great. The kids love it. And I do. <laughs> right, thank you, gentlemen. Thank you.